Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I am very pleased to uh, be here today to uh, uh, welcome our speaker. Dr. Peter Anglin <clears throat> obtained his uh, medical degree from Queen's University at Kingston and followed this with clinical fellowships in internal medicine, clinical hematology, and oncology. Uh, Dr. Anglin's clinical focus has been in hematologic and lymphoid malignancies, and he's currently the physician lead for the Stronic Regional Cancer Center at South Lake at Newmarket. And with both public and private sector clinical experience, he has uh, developed an interest in health systems delivery, process uh, de redesign in the ambulatory setting, and optimizing drug access for oncology patients, which obviously is very important to us. <clears throat> Full disclosure, in 2008, when Dr. Anglin was still at Princess Margaret, he uh, got me through transplant number two, and I was quite pleased that in 2010, he migrated north to Newmarket, where I am, and he continues to be a part of my treatment with the rest of the team up there, and uh, helped me uh, be uh, approved for a transplant number three in 2000 and, or, I'm sorry, 2018. So coming up on six years next month, and uh, I'm doing good. So without further ado, would you please join me in giving Dr. Peter Anglin a huge round of welcoming. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first, congratulations to the organizers. I've done many talks over the years on sunny Saturday afternoons and there's five people in the audience. So, I mean, it's a real credit, I think, to the organizing team, and I can see they're extremely well organized, but also just to generate enthusiasm. So, uh, congrats to the team. Bob, thanks for asking me. Um, I practice up in Newmarket. I've been uh, treating myeloma and seeing patients with myeloma for 25 years. Um, I've been around the block. I was downtown. What Bob didn't tell you is uh, we first met when he had his transplant, or you may have mentioned at PMH, but I was, he reminded me, I guess I was making rounds one Saturday, and I was in the room and out of the room before the medical student had finished running, you know, I was hurrying, and Bob got a little kick out of that. I don't, that was some time ago. Um, today, then, uh, what's nice is, you know, we're all so busy in clinic. We, we don't have a lot of time sometimes to, explain as much as we'd like to or, or get into some details. So today, I'm going to give you a very practical presentation. The first few slides will be Myeloma 101, and I recognize there's varying knowledge bases in the room with regards to myeloma, so if some of this is review, then it's review. And then quickly, I'll just try to talk about what's the standard today for myeloma, upfront treatment, maintenance therapy, transplant ineligible, and then there's a focus at the end of the new cellular therapies, the CART procedure you've heard about, and by specific antibody therapy, of which the latter now is available and being given in the community in Ontario now. So I think it's important for you guys to know about. Um, I, I'll take questions as I go. <coughs> it's 20 after 2. Um, there'll be a break in maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes. So yeah, maybe, I'll just, maybe you can just give me a nudge of when you think a good time for the break is. And we'll go from there and feel it up. Okay. And so feel free to put up your, your hand as I go. So this is what we're going to talk about. I sort of told you we're going to give an overview and just talk a little. We'll focus on therapy, what's current today, and what's changing recently. Because things are always changing in myeloma, as you know. Um, yeah, these are the motherhood slides that I usually show. But about 4,000 cases a year in, uh, in Canada, which is really something. We think that um, you know, a, about 10 years is a reasonable guess of how long someone's going to live with myeloma. There's many factors to that, and we're going to talk about risk stratification. When I first trained in the mid-90s uh, down at Princess Margaret Hospital, um, we would tell people that they would live about three years. We had melphalan and cyclophosphamide and lenalidomide and all those other drugs weren't around. So in, in my practice life, which is getting longer now, um, I have seen a sea tide change in what's happened with myeloma. So, so that's been a good thing. Um, myeloma 101, was, what is it? 
It's a tumor of bone marrow cells, the plasma cell, and these, thing, these cells start to proliferate, and when they grow, they crowd out the other cells, and your other blood counts drop, put holes in bones, and they secrete a protein, the, uh, the immunoglobulin, the heavy chain, and uh, the light chains, and we measure that. And what we measure in the blood is usually a good indicator of what the tumor volume is. So as you get your treatment, you want to know what your M protein or your light chains are doing. And that really gives us a pretty good idea of what's happening with your myeloma. It's not just that, though. When we start to give therapy, we hope that people feel better, their pain goes away, their energy is improving, all of that comes together. So that's, myelo that's sort of it for myeloma, if you will. Um, the symptoms are nonspecific for myeloma. I don't see people, I don't usually diagnose a lot of myeloma. I get sent people who have a high protein and holes in their bones, or they've had surgery just like I saw someone on Friday, and they had a plasma cytoma just impinging on their spinal cord. And so they get operated on, the patient's doing fine, but they've come to me and I'm investigating them for myeloma. So most of the, this kind of awareness is important in sort of primary care, that kind of thing. So myeloma does not get too advanced and you have end organ problems because we like to intervene before you get into big problems. Hi, Peter. Uh, Peter and I bike together. We're doing the ride to conquer cancer in, in, uh, in a week. Um, what is myeloma? The, the important thing when we think about it, a, a lot of people can have a, a protein in their blood, the M protein, um, but they're perfectly well. And we use terms like monoclonal gammopathy or smoldering myeloma, where you've got some plasma cells in your bone marrow, but you feel perfectly well. And in those cases, it's good to do nothing. And it's kind of hard to tell people, yeah, you've kind of got something, but it may not do anything. But in those cases, a lot of patients may never progress to symptomatic myeloma and may never need treatment. So when I see someone with plasma cells in their bone marrow and proteins and things, we follow, I'll follow you regularly to see if your kidneys are infected, your blood counts change, or you have changes in your bones. And that can be for years and years. And I've followed people 15 years and they've declared themselves with myeloma. And I've followed people for six months and they declare themselves with myeloma. So that's the important thing is you don't always need treatment for this disease. And we use the term smoldering myeloma for that. You need to be followed though. What's the natural course of myeloma over time? Well, you'll see people can be asymptomatic as I described. And if that's the case, we don't do anything, but you do need to be followed by a hematologist. Monoclonal gammopathy is where you have a low protein and everything's fine. I often will advise a family physician to follow, and I get involved if there's changes later. When, when it's smoldering myeloma where the paraprotein's higher and there's more plasma cells in the bone marrow, that's when I get involved and start following in. I might see you at four to six month intervals as well. Eventually you need treatment and that protein goes up. So on the left hand, where you see on the left the Y axis, that when that protein starts to go up and your organs are affected, that's where we get involved and we're gonna talk about all the different treatments. But generally we can put most people into some sort of remission, whether it's partial or a very good or a complete remission. Um, we can control the disease for a good period of time, but in the majority of patients at some point, things start to, you get recrudescence of disease and those plasma cells grow, and that's where you see the, for a variable period of time, you see the proteins start to go up there. And so then you are treated again. And each relapse can be a little more difficult to treat because the myeloma genetically changes and gets a little smarter each time. But we also have a lot of effective therapies now, so it's not uncommon that people with myeloma can have three, four, or five lines of therapy. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about those of what's current today in Canada around those lines of therapy. Um, this, is a, this slide just simply says, when you have a myeloma, you've got hundreds of millions of cells that are myeloma in your blood, they're not all the same. They have different mothers and fathers and they respond differently. So we talk about different clones and so some of the myeloma cells may respond to lenalidomide and some other cells may respond to cyclophosphamide. So that's why we, we slice and dice and mix because we hit different populations of the myeloma. So when you have myeloma, even within you, there's different populations of myeloma in with you. And that's the importance of combining three or occasionally four drugs when, when you're getting different regimens. 
a question, as I investigate someone with myeloma, one of the things that we do is something called risk stratification. And that means are you high risk or are you standard risk? And this is some things that, that we look at when we see someone in our clinic. The first thing is just, you know, how fit are you? How fit is the patient? Frailty, and there's measurements of that. It may sound obvious, but a, a fit 50-year-old does better than a very unfit 80-year-old. And I'm not being facetious, that's, but that, that's something that we weigh because we have to gauge therapies. Um, aggressiveness of clinical presentation. Some people present with a little bit of anemia, feel perfectly well. Uh, they warrant therapy versus someone coming into hospital with kidney failure and high calcium and heavy disease burden in their bones. So the aggressiveness of the presentation can affect how we manage people. Cytogenetics are important. So the genetic abnormalities, when, when you get a bone marrow examination and we look at the DNA of it, that helps predict how aggressive your particular myeloma will be. The most famous thing is something called deletion of the P arm of the 17th chromosome, deletion 17P. There's a couple of others. But if you have what we define as high-risk cytogenetics, you will be approached a little bit differently. And if you're transplant eligible, you may get a couple of transplants. If you're getting maintenance after that, you're going to get two drugs instead of one very often for high-risk disease. So we manage it somewhat differently. Um, and then at the end of that, we put all that together so we have prognost we can sort of run these curves to say, are you high risk, average risk, or lower risk? And oh, that, that's just what a fish study looks like. When, when we send off, when we do your bone marrow, we send it to a special lab, and then they label, they label the chromosomes with certain probes that glow in fluorescent light. And that's when the technician is reading your fish result. That's what they see under the microscope when they're looking for abnormalities. I always thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and this is just, you don't need to, this is, the details aren't so important, but we can put scores together. And you might have heard of the ISS score because, you know, certainly in, in my clinic, if, if I'm seeing you, your note starts with 73-year-old male, RISS stage three, standard risk cytogenetics. We, we very quickly put that at the top so we know how your myeloma is because myeloma is a very heterogeneous disease. It's not the same for everyone. Some people it's very indolent, other people it's very aggressive and you get everything in between. So it's important to separate that out for me as a clinician to think about it when I see you because that helps frame the therapies that we're going to suggest for you, how aggressive we're going to be with it. Now one term that, this is a hot term and those of you that have been reading about myeloma is minimal residual disease myeloma. What, what does that mean? If we do a bone marrow on you and I look at it under the microscope, I can probably at best get down to about 1% or see one in 100 cells that may be the abnormal plasma cells. So my eye looking at your bone marrow under the microscope as I was trained can see one in 100 cells. There are techniques that can detect one in 100,000 cells. And one of their, they're used different DNA-based studies or something called flow cytometry. And so in study centers and on research trials, when you get put on drugs, we can tell that someone's gone into complete remission conventionally by looking under the light microscope and the proteins gone in the blood. But there are fancier tests to see if you're in a really, really deep remission. And that's what you see at the bottom here. Oops. If you look at the bottom of that, as you, as you get down to very few cells, I might say, oh, you're in remission, when in fact we can find more cells by very sensitive methods. So if you, by very sensitive methods, have no cells detectable, we use the term minimal residual disease negative. And if you are MRD negative, your outlook is much better in terms of the duration of your remission and likely the duration of your life. And so these are newer measurement tools that are not available everywhere. There are still no data that suggests that I have to have that in my clinic because it's going to change my decision making. I expect, though, in three to five years, wherever you're being treated, be it Princess Margaret Hospital or Newmarket or Brampton, that this will come into the decision making about 
MRD testing and do you start or stop a drug or do you adjust therapy? That is not, uh, that is not happening right now because the data is not there to support the decision making. So I spend a little time on this because when you read about myeloma, you see a lot about MRD. And this is just how in the clinic today, I, again, I, I, I have you look at the bottom there. There are currently no prospective clinical trial data telling us how to use the MRD data yet. So I don't want you to go back to your docs next week and say, Anglin said MRD is the best thing and we should all get it. And where do I get it? Because, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's a fair question. <clears throat> but it's coming. And again, I would guess in three to five years, you'll be coming into my clinic and maybe after transplant, you've been on maintenance for two years, and you say, I don't really like taking the lenalidomide. I go, I don't blame you. And we do an MRD test that's negative, then I say, you can stop the lenalidomide. That's sort of the things that we'll be starting to do is, is uh, patient-specific uh, decision-making based on MRD. But we're just not quite there yet. PMH does, if you ask where is it being done, Pete's got, Peter's got a question. PMH does it nowhere else in the GTA. Peter, question. Probably not. I mean, yes, there's a log, one log difference, but, um, but I think it's early days about how is that really going to parse out about decision making and do you make a decision about stopping a drug based on the minus five versus minus six parameter and is that really making a difference? So my answer is I don't know. Oh, sorry. Yeah, when there's a question, I'm to repeat it. The question was, is there a difference between 10 to the minus 5 sensitivity for MRD detection and 10 to the minus 6, which translates to 1 in 100,000 and 1 in a million, which is a big deal. Um, and I don't think at this time we can say there's a big clinical difference because trials, as Peter knows, point out that they use different sensitivities of the MRD testing depending on their method. Thanks, Peter. And this, uh, it's a busy slide. Uh, just for those of you not familiar with Kaplan-Meier, do I have a pointer? So I just realized I, I usually bring a pointer. I'm sorry I didn't. Um, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. And just to explain it, because there are a couple of these curves. So time zero is at the bottom, 12, 24 months. So that's time along, along the x-axis. And then the, uh, what you see on the y-axis is the, the probability of survival. And at time zero, Everyone is, everyone is alive and free of progression. And as time goes on, people relapse. And so the curve starts to drop. So in, in cancer and in myeloma, we look at a lot of curves like this to gauge the effectiveness of therapy. And the ideal therapy would be 100% of people are alive at time zero, and 100% of people are alive 10 years from now, right? Perfect therapy, no one succumbs to anything. The real world is people succumb to things related to the disease, and people also have heart attacks and other issues. So over time, the, the curves fall. And this just says if you're MRD negative, you know, you're, those, those curves stay high for a long time, less people relapse. So that's what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve, and I'll be showing you a couple of those today. Um, and this is the last sort of speaking about minimal residual disease. When we treat you with therapy, we, we start treatment and then you get a partial response, that's PR. You go down to a very good partial response. You get a complete response. And we have criterion for all of this about how many plasma cells are there, how, how high is the protein in your blood. And the idea with our therapy is get you into the deepest remission possible. And this is a disease that tends to relapse, but the deeper your remission, it takes longer for you to have clinically evident recurrent disease. So that's just illustrating, again, the importance of dropping the disease to a minimal level that we can so you're free of, free of progressive myeloma for as long as possible. Yeah? So you mentioned the phrase earlier, complete remission. Does that mean there is no relapse? Complete what we define as complete remission is there's no plasma cells that we can see in the bone marrow when we look, if we do a bone marrow after. Although most of us do not do serial bone marrows in people when you're responding because it doesn't affect our decisions to stop the therapy. But it means we don't see any plasma cells if we look and the protein's gone. <clears throat> what it me doesn't mean is that you're, you're cured. What it means is we're just not able to detect the number of myeloma cells that are in you anymore. And that's a very good thing. 
And that's where we get to these more sensitive me me measures of minimal residual disease that are even, you know, we can't detect one in 100,000 cells, and that's even better. But most people, after frontline therapy with myeloma, tend to relapse. Now, if you get a transplant and you're on maintenance therapy, there's about 30% of people that are in remission 10 years later. So there's a lot of long-term people who stay free of disease. We use the term functional cure. But so we, we, this term cure with myeloma has been one, we, we're never quite sure what to say about it. And so this, this term has evolved functional cure. Because I got a lot of people in my clinic, 10 years out, they're fine, they're doing great. 12 years out, they're fine, they're great. But is there a little bit of myeloma in them? Maybe. And so they need to come to my clinic every four months and have a cup of coffee. Yeah. Well, sometimes. Um, this, a lot of you may have seen these slides. So again, when I started working, we had sort of melphalan and cyclophosphamide and high-dose dexamethasone. But as time went on, there's been a plethora of new drugs. I'm not going to name everyone here. In the red, we're going to focus on a couple of these at the end. At the top is teclistamab, elranatinab. Those are two bispecific antibodies which are approved in Canada and now being given both at Quaternary or big centers downtown, but also now in the community. And then there's the chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy, the CART therapies. These are the two down here. And so I'll, I'll talk about that because these are sort of changing how we we treat later, later stages of multiple myeloma. And then there's all the drugs in between. I'm going to touch on some of those, OK? So a lot, it's been a busy space and an interesting space to be in. And this just, we've got all kinds of drugs that we can use. We put them in different classes. Um, I'll be focusing a little bit on the antibody therapies, the daratumumab and the isatuximab and a little bit on the immune cell therapy at today's talk, because those are sort of the newer things that are changing what we do. This is a terrible slide, eh? This is, so this, Cadeth, uh, this is the, 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 the funders for drugs in Canada. This is how they classify myeloma and all the therapies in first line, second line, and third line. And so th th this is actually a very important slide for what I do. Uh, and I'm just going to, I'll talk a little bit about frontline therapy for transplant eligible and in ineligible. And I'm going to talk about second line therapy a little bit too. But don't worry about all the details. But every day when I'm seeing someone relapse in my clinic, I have to check with my pharmacist about the funding status of a particular regimen, even for someone who does it every day. It, it's a lot. Um, this is a slide that just says, when you get treatment for your myeloma, you want the best treatment up front. It's not about saving, this business about saving drugs, we hear about, like, let's save it for later. You should get the best regimen possible up front, whether you're on transplant stream or, or not getting a transplant. And I'll allude to that a little bit. And um, th this is actually Canadian data of attrition rates where you get, some people get one line of therapy and then fall off the curve because of comorbidities or death. Um, but the fall off rates in Canada are actually less than the United States that's been reported. So I don't know if that speaks to we're doing better here, they, but um, I think it may be generalizability of uh, drug access here, which is overall pretty good. And so this, is you know new new diagnosis of myeloma transplant eligible and transplant eligible what does that mean well if you're we think that giving high dose melphalan taking out your stem cells putting them in a test tube giving you high dose melphalan and then giving your your stem cells back that's just a, that's just a trick to give you higher doses of therapy a stem cell transplant is a good thing and we generally give it to people up to the age of 70 who are reasonably fit and we think that likely adds a year or more of life to people. And there's always this debate about when are we going to throw out this old chemotherapy that's been around for 50 years. But the truth is, I have seen several people who aren't responding to lenalidomide, aren't responding to bortezomib or carfilzomib and daratumumab, get high-dose melphalan, and their disease goes into remission. So it's still a drug that works. It's still something that we favor in people who are generally 70 or less without significant medical issues. 
And so, and if you're not that person, so if you're 74, well, you know what? You get, we, are, we don't really consider you transplant eligible, but you can still get very effective therapy and live eight to 10 years. So just to be clear on that. So that's sort of what, when we talk about transplant eligible or ineligible, we kind of cut it off around 70. Now, I've had 72, I just sent someone, he's 72, he's a pretty fit guy, and he, he's getting a transplant, but I'll have 65 year olds with medical, or 60 year olds who've got a lot of medical issues that, that are not transplanted. So it's, it's a little bit of individual stuff. And if I'm not sure, I'll send them downtown for the opinion. Princess Margaret Hospital, as most of you know, does the transplants around here. Um, and just, oh yeah, Peter, please. Are we seeing much second transplant? So the second transplant, so when people get a stem cell transplant and then most get put on maintenance, lenalidomide, the duration, the Canadian data duration of response is four and a half years. That's Canadian data. If you relapse more than two years after your first transplant, they'll consider giving you a second transplant. When they collect your stem cells, they collect, they collect enough for, for two transplants and they store them in a fridge. In fact, I was, when I was working downtown, one day we were having a meeting with the myeloma group and someone burst in the door and said, the fridges are full. <laughs> okay, didn't someone think of that sooner? <laughs> Anyhow, we solved the crisis, <laughs> but I'll always remember that. But we, cannot, we collect enough for two transplants. But this just illustrates what a transplant is. Basically, we collect the stem cells out of your peripheral blood. We put them in a test tube. We admit you to hospital, give you high-dose melphalan, and then the day or two after, we give you your stem cells back. And this is just a trick to give higher doses of melphalan, which kills more myeloma cells. That's all a transplant is. It's a trick to give high-dose melphalan and to consolidate what we do for induction. And again, this is something we consider largely in people 70 or less with, with some variability. Um, this is Canadian, Canadian data from, there's a Canadian myeloma research group, CMRG. They're very active. They're getting a reputation on the world stage. They have a database of 10,000 myeloma patients. We're actually joining that database shortly. Um, and this is Canadian data on, uh, on transplant. And the long and the short, you'll see the overall survival here, that, that's that top curve. If you sort of go off to what 50% is, you're at about 14 or 15 year survival here. And if you look at the, the progression-free survival curve, which is the purple curve, you see there you get about four and a half, five years of remission from your transplant. So, you know, induction, transplant, maintenance, lenalidomide, four and a half, five years of remission, understanding about 30% of people can be in remission 10 years later. I don't want to overwhelm you with stats. I know I, I find it's a lot too, but this is good Canadian data. I would tell you the Canadian data is as good as anywhere in the world for transplant and our outcomes. So I think we can be really pleased about that. I'm tired of hearing about the US, frankly. <laughs> um, how can we make transplant better? And this is, you know, better risk assessment, getting the right patients. I'm going to show you some evolving data now that we start, we prefer to give daratumumab up front before the transplant. I'm going to show you a current reported trial on that. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is things like CAR-T and, and uh, bispecifics in the transplant setting, but that's a, a ways away. So two newer drugs that we've been using are daratumumab and isatuximab. What are those? They're antibody drugs. They, they look like this sort of inverted Y, if you see, and they target a protein on the plasma cell. It's called CD38. It's a protein. And so this is part of our targeted therapy that we give to people. When, we, when you give those drugs, they activate the immune system to basically nuke the myeloma cell. And both isatuximab and daratumumab work at CD38. So these are monoclonal antibodies. They're not chemotherapy. We've been using daratumumab quite a lot in the last two years, uh, two, three, maybe, maybe actually about four years in first relapse and then upfront transplant ineligible patients. So these are drugs we know well, and isatuximab has been around a while too. So lots of this is just, yeah, please. So the question is, daratumumab, and how is it approved? 
And if you want it, you have to pay for it. So the answer is it depends. So daratumumab was funded for relapsed myeloma about three, four years ago. It was funded for upfront transplant ineligible myeloma about two years ago. Where it's not funded, and I'm about to show you the trial, is for transplant eligible myeloma, where, where you do have to pay for it, or if you have third party payer, they'll pay for it. And the reason that we think it should be funded is this trial here. So you're, it's like a planted question. So uh, the next question is, should daratumumab be used for transplant eligible patients? So when people are diagnosed with myeloma, you'll get about four or five months of systemic therapy up front, then you get your transplant. And when you get that treatment up front, you go into remission in the majority of time, people start to feel better, and it's generally fairly well tolerated. So this trial looked at three drugs, bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, and then half the people got the daratumumab as well, and the other half didn't. So really it explored is it of benefit to give daratumumab to people going to transplant? That's the question. And, you know, the short answer is the response rates were higher, and you'll see the MRD negativity. So you're, better, you're good to be MRD negative, 75 versus 47%. So that usually portends for better outcome. But the, really where the rubber hits the road is the progression-free survival curve. So that's up there on your left. And the blue curve is higher than the other curve. So at four years, 84% versus 68%. So there is a benefit to adding daratumumab in terms of maintaining a longer remission in the transplant setting. That's what we know. I can't tell you if you're gonna live longer if you get daratumumab in the transplant setting up front. So what I see, I, you know, every few weeks I see a new myeloma patient. Um, we talk and they're transplant eligible, I'll bring up daratumumab, I'll show them this data. I will say that the survival data is not declaring itself yet, so we don't, because there's always less difference in survival than progression-free survival, I want to emphasize that. So RVD alone without daratumumab is still very effective therapy with transplant and maintenance lenalidomide. And the Canadian data I showed you of four and a half year remissions largely based on that and more a cyborg D induction. So, um, yes, I think you, if the best treatment we would consider is RVD plus daratumumab for transplant. Yeah? So, what about the second half? Is it, is it a single code? No. The it's, it's second tra the, Oh, sorry, I apologize. The question is for a second transplant, does the same issue hold with daratumumab? And the answer is no. This was done strictly new diagnosis, uh, daratumumab, yes or no, and first transplant. For the second transplant, most people going to second transplant, you know, are people that are relapsing later around four or five years. And the truth is we're not sure what to use for an induction in those patients. Um, because one of the concerns is if we give something like lenalidomide and, and uh, daratumumab with dexamethasone and then they get a transplant, we want to make sure the funders keep funding the DRD afterwards. So it's always a little bit of a dance for the second transplant. So my approach to transplant two, if you didn't have daratumumab up front, I still try to work it into the regimen. But they need an induction again, they get the transplant, and then we keep them on treatment. So daratumumab is good with transplant, but, uh, and I, that may eventually be funded. What funders often look for it, and in fairness to the funders, I think Canada, if you look on a world stage, Canada does pretty well for funding for myeloma. I have to say that because I see my colleagues in other places and it is not as good at all. Um, so we do pretty well. The funders often want to see the survival benefit here, not just the progression-free survival benefit. And so we'll see where that comes out. What about maintenance therapy? So when people get a transplant, after your first transplant, generally we put people on lenalidomide maintenance. Couple questions, we generally keep you on the lenalidomide for as long as the disease is in remission. When you start to relapse, we rethink what we're going to do. Um, there's a lot of data looking at standard risk patients starting to evolve that maybe only need the lenalidomide for two or three years, and then you can come off it. That has not become standard practice, but this is where the MRD testing after a transplant, if you can't detect any 
two or three years later, maybe you don't need to take that pill that makes you feel a little more tired, gives you a little bit of diarrhea, and causes a few little symptoms that really can affect some people's quality of life. Some people sail through lenalidomide, others have more problems. So my, my approach is if you're having problems with standard risk disease after two or three years, I say, well, let's stop it and we'll keep an eye on you. Um, the other piece is high risk patients. Generally, we keep you on two drugs for maintenance. So it's lenalidomide and then and injected bortezomib or oral exazomib, which is still available. It's like bortezomib, but it's oral. So I tend to give what's called dual maintenance in that setting. Um, and if you could get DRD, daratumumab induction and you have high risk disease, I put people on daratumumab maintenance if your insurance allows me as well. So, so my message for high risk patients is more for longer. That's sort of a theme and there's some variability around that. Uh, this looks pretty busy too, eh? Um, I'll really simplify this. So transplant ineligible. So 74 year old comes to clinic, they have myeloma whether it's standard risk or high risk, generally our approach is to give a DRD, which is daratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. I probably put 70% of my first line uh, non-transplant eligible patients on DRD. Works very effectively, tends to be pretty well tolerated. There are side effects always with these treatments, particularly infection, which we watch, and sometimes we prophylax with a couple of drugs to help prevent infection, although it's by far not perfect. But the standard really is DRD for most patients. We'll use some, sometimes I'll give bortezomib-based uh, uh, inductions if you've got really bad kidneys and had aggressive disease. We tend to get in with uh, bortezomib, but I can still give the daratumumab up front. So there's not a lot of discussion in most non-transplant eligible patients about what to do. And then we generally maintain that treatment for as long as the disease is responding, which for DRD frontline on the clinical trial was five years, which is why when someone's 69 and they, they say, Dr. Angle, I don't know if I really want to go through all that transplant business. Because you get a transplant, you're still, it takes you three or four months to recover. You're hospitalized for a couple of weeks. You may need transfusion support for a bit. It, it, it's quite an undertaking for a lot of people. And so if people are borderline, say, well, we've got a frontline therapy now that gives you around five years of uh, progression-free survival. So, it's, it's sort of taken the pressure off transplant a little bit, depending on patient choices. Um, and this just shows you, this is the, this is the, the frontline DRD data, which is a progression-free survival of about 62 months. There was a real world study. So in the real world, patients never do quite as good with the drugs as they do in the clinical trial. Because clinical trials cherry pick patients, right? Your kidney's got to work certainly, you've got to have reasonable counts, you have to have what's called pretty good performance status. And the real world, at least in my clinic, not everyone is like that, yet they get treated with the regimen. So the real world data for this suggests maybe the, the duration of response is three years or a little bit more, depending on what you do. That's a real world, I forget where that report came from, it was at the American Hematology meeting last year. Just now, does that mean it's three years or five years or somewhere in between? But just, you know, again, one has to watch clinical trial data and extrapolating it to you. Um, now, if you're a fit person, you fit all the trial eligibility, then that may be the case. But, but if you take all comers, we usually don't hit the marks of trials quite as well. But you can actually do better than the trial, too. I don't want to be completely negative here. <laughs> so we're sort of, this is a, I, I keep apologizing for busy slides, but I hope that uh, you know, now looking at this, you know that on the, on the left is the transplant arm and what, what we do, and on the right is the non-transplant arm. ASCT stands for autologous stem cell transplant, so that's an ac acronym we tend to use. And really, you know, what I wanna talk a little bit about is what we do in the second line when the, when the disease relapses. Um, so what happens when most people relapse, if you had a transplant, you're on lenalidomide, lenalidomide maintenance. And if you didn't have a transplant, most people relapsing right now are on lenalidomide with dexamethasone as part of the RVD regimen. And so really you're what we call um, len refractory. And so that sort of frames what sort of therapies we can give. And 
One of the most common treatments that we are giving now in first relapse, so you had an upfront therapy, whether it was transplant or induction therapy, transplant maintenance lenalidomide, or you had RVD and then RD maintenance, or now if you're, if you're, if you're relapsing off of DRD. Um, one of the most common treatments we're giving is isotuximab, carfilzomib, and dexamethasone. That's a tongue twister, I know. This, this is a treatment you cannot give if you've already had daratumumab. It wouldn't be funded in the system. So most people relapsing right now in first relapse have not seen a first-line uh, CD38 antibody. And with this therapy, people get about three years on the clinical trial. So most fit patients, uh, they, uh, transplant patients tend to be a bit younger. And so most of them will give this treatment to it is more demanding though. Um, the carfilzomib is given weekly, sort of three weeks in a row with a week off. And it can sometimes affect the heart. It can sometimes affect the kidneys. And if you look at this trial in detail, for patients that were refractory to lenalidomide, it may not be 36 months. It may be 18 months that you get. And remember, I want to emphasize, I'm giving you these numbers, but that doesn't mean it's going to apply to you. But that said, numbers from clinical trials give us a baseline. So when I talk to you in the clinic about what the options are, this is a baseline to help you make decisions and help me make decisions. So it does mean something. And so uh, the isotuximab, carfilzomib, dexamethasone is something we're giving a lot of too in people who are relapsing off of lenalidomide. Uh, and that, and, and even transplant and eligible patients, if you're reasonably fit, like I can give this to people in their mid 70s as long as you're reasonably fit. Um, so that's that. That's that. Now, there's some other options that are new and on the table, and one of them is is a little easier to tolerate from a heart and kidney standpoint, and that's the XVD, which is Selinexor with bortezomib and dexamethasone. Um, and that's a, a, an option that, that I'm encouraging patients to get who may not tolerate the isotuximab, carfilzomib, and dexamethasone. And so this is an oral agent, Selinexor. It's a, basically it's a drug that plugs a hole in, in the, in, on the nucleus membrane and, and, and things accumulate inside the nucleus and the cell dies. That's how it works. That's my simplistic approach to it. But it's an oral agent given once a week, and it's given in with bortezomib injected once a week. So with this regimen, you also have to come to the clinic and get an injection, but it's under the skin. But the bortezomib is easier to tolerate than the intravenous carfilzomib. So this is another option for patients. And this was the trial that it's called the Boston trial. I'm not going to worry about the details here for you. And on this trial, the you know, patients got about 14 months in total. but in the subset of patients who had one prior line of therapy and had seen lenalidomide, they were about 16 months or so. So this is just, again, there's more than one option when you relapse on lenalidomide. The isotuximab, carfilzomib, dexamethasone is a stronger one, tolerated by a lot of people, but this one's a little easier to tolerate. Nausea can be an issue, but that can be managed very well. We've had Selinexor available and funded just for the last, oh, six to eight months. And before that, the company was providing it compassionately to it. So it just adds to our choices for patients. One of the therapies that we give a fair amount of in relapse is pomalidomide. Some of you may have heard or taken pomalidomide. That's the, what I like about this regimen is it's all oral. It's pomalidomide oral, three weeks on, one week off with weekly cyclophosphamide orally, which some of you have been on before for other things, and dexamethasone. And so this is another very common regimen used in Canada a lot in more commonly third-line therapy. So after ISA-KD or XVD, I don't want to overwhelm you with terms, this is something I might give third-line as an oral therapy, which often can get 10 months or 12 months out of, out of people. I've ha I have someone, I think I have one of the longest people ever on PCD. Uh, he's, I think, five and a half years on PCD as a third line treatment. So occasionally with myeloma, again, these people don't read the textbooks and they do much better than they should. 
Um, now we're going to talk about the newer therapies, just this last bit. So most in the Canadian environment, you'll usually get, like I'm talking right now, three lines of sort of the drugs that you see, these different lines here. And after three lines of therapy, our options are really limited for meaningful therapy that can put you into remission and get your quality of life back. Yeah? Can you Sure. The question is, what does line of therapy mean? Great question. Um, <clears throat> so, excuse me, a first line, so we talk about line of therapy is a, is a treatment regimen that you give for a certain duration and then the disease progresses, progresses and so you have to change the treatment to something else, which we would call a second line of therapy. And, you know, we put the disease to sleep again, but over time, generally, the disease progresses and you become resistant to that, and then we have to put that regimen to bed and go to a third line therapy. Does that answer the question? Yeah, just for, and here I've listed it more sort of hierarchical, but from front line, second line, third line, and each time we look at a line of therapy, there's a number of choices you see there, but for, patient, for disease specific and patient specific factors, we'll choose what's, what's best for you. And there's patient preference there, like, hey, I don't want to come to the clinic every week. Is there an all oral option? And that's a viable quality of life question I get a lot. You know, these kind of questions. Yeah. So, so how do you cut <coughs> these, these lines? Okay. Is, is, is uh, reduction one line and then the other line and then the third line? So the, the question is, how do you define the lines? And frontline therapy, I was having this discussion with someone else. Frontline therapy is a little different. So frontline therapy, if you're transplant eligible, is induction therapy, which I usually give RVD, and then the transplant, and then maintenance lenalidomide. That's one big package of frontline therapy, all right? So when you're relapsing off of lenalidomide maintenance after a transplant, we're talking about second line therapy. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you look on the list here, you'll see a number of choices for second line, of which the ISA KD is the one we tend to give. If there's no reason not to give it, that's what I recommend for people because the data is best for that. Or Selenex or the XVD is the other one that I'll use. But after that, it's just then, then you know, it's ISA KD until you progress. Then it's pomalidomide, cyclophosphamide until you progress. And that's the usual Canadian evolution of lines, by the way, even right now. And it's when you progress after the third line therapy, we got a problem because the myeloma is tougher, it's genetically altered, and it's more resistant to treatment. But fortunately now, we have access to cellular therapies. And so I'm going to take about 15 minutes to talk about the CART procedure and by specific antibodies. Uh, CART is not available yet in Canada for funding. By specific antibodies are not funded either, but by specific antibodies are now available from the companies compassionately and so are being given in a variety of centers. So we're going to talk a little bit about this fourth line treatment because the old drugs that we have, once you hit fourth line, are much more of a problem. And so we're, these newer agents are really exciting because they change the game and can put you into remission for a couple of years again. So let's talk about those. So, you know, again, we call them novel therapies, but there's largely, I'm going to have you focus on the right side of the, the picture there, and on the top there's something called Siltacel, um, and that's a CART product, I'm going to show you about it, and then the other three drugs around that, I don't name these things, by the way, <laughs> Talketamab, Elranatumab, and Teclistamab, so most of the time, learning about these drugs, it's more the pronunciation of the drugs because using them isn't such a... So anyhow, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So all of these therapies, um, particularly the CART and the bispecific antigens, they target the myeloma cell and they pull the immune system into the myeloma cell and the immune system does the work. That's really how they work. So they're using, harnessing the immune system rather than toxic drugs to kill the cell. So what is it? So CART stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. And what, what it is, if you start, what basically you take the T white, the white cells out of a patient, 
you send them off to a lab for about four weeks where they do some very fancy things to your own T cells. And they, these T cells start to, oh, can you see my pointer up there when I'm doing this? Yeah. Yeah. Sort of a white, oh yeah, good, you can. Um, basically, the T cell expresses this receptor. You, you grow these in the lab, you infuse them back into somebody, and this T cell goes to the tumor and harnesses the immune system to break up the, uh, so it's really cool. Um, it can be very effective, and I'm gonna show you a little data on this. This is available. It has, these drugs have license and uh, notice of, uh, of, of approval in, the United, in Canada and the United States. There is not public funding yet, but there are trials using the CART drugs going on in Canada, and I expect public funding will come shortly for at least one of these. So this is just uh, showing what's the benefits of this procedure. So on these trials, often patients had four or five lines of therapy, so we know what lines of therapy are now. These patients had four or five different lines of therapy, and still the response rate was three out of four patients. Three quarters of patients, are, it's a one-time procedure. You come into hospital, you get infused with this, you're in hospital for about eight to 10 to 12 days, you're discharged and then you're followed closely as an outpatient. Now, it's not so easy. Now, I'm giving you all the good stuff about this, but this is a toxic therapy that can have life-threatening consequences. Because what happens is when you inject these white cells into people and they activate the immune system, you release a lot of substances that causes your body to drop the blood pressure, you can get fevers, you can get leaky capillaries and fluid on the lungs and other things. So there is potential toxicity with this, the majority of which can be very effectively managed. This is done in hospital. So again, there's the, there is Canadian experience with this, usually at the larger university or quaternary sites. This is not a therapy that's made its way to community hospitals, and it's still going to be the bastion of the transplant centers that perform this. So just like they do autologous transplants, they take out your stem cells, they give them back. This is different, they take out your T cells, they, they send them off to the United States, they get engineered, they come back here, and they infuse them into you. So there are, there are toxicities associated with this, it requires hospitalization. And if you just, this is just, um, here's a trial, and I, the numbers, don't, don't worry about the details, simply this trial, people had six lines of therapy all, uh, on average till they got here, and the response rate was about 75%, and the complete response rate was 33%. And so, you know, very effective therapy. And some of these patients, if you get a complete response, you can be in remission for two or three years. So you see why there's a lot of excitement around these treatments. now. One of the challenges is these products cost about $400,000. Um, that's the, so what happens though, that's the, no, that's the number, but the negotiated rate, when, when, when payers work with governments, that's never the rate they pay and it's always a big secret. But, but this is not a cheap therapy, just to, that's the first thing. So, you know, so as our public, uh, as, as the system works to look at how we're going to pay for it and how it's going to be approved, you know, this is something they need to look hard at about what are the outcomes, how can it be most judiciously and effectively approved. So I'm confident we will have access to CART in time, but right now it's, it's not so accessible in Canada. There's a, this is the other drug, probably the better drug is the Siltacel, um, and they, this had, they had less lines of therapy here. But here you see 18 months after the CART procedure, um, the progression free, two thirds of patients are free of disease a year and a half later. And this is patients that had several median lines of therapy here with six. So this is myeloma, it's multiply relapse. They get this treatment and you've got two thirds of patients 18 months later in remission. So this is why we're all excited about this therapy. Um, there's a lot of other drugs. This is just to show you, I showed you the first two on the left there. There's a bunch of other drugs being developed uh, as CART therapies. They're trying to make them less toxic, easier to give, and try to do it as an outpatient even. That's where this will be going. It doesn't always work though. The biggest reason is, is the myeloma is too aggressive. The problem with CART is from the time I say, you know what, Ted, you need a, you know, we've run out of options here. Let's do the CART procedure. 
well, you got to book a leukophoresis date 10 days from now. They're, they get sent off. It's going to take four to five weeks for the manufacturing. Then we got to admit you to hospital. So there's, it ends up being two months or something. And someone who's got an aggressive relapse of myeloma, that just doesn't work. So that's the challenge of CART. It's going to be done in specialized centers. And it's not off the shelf. It's, it's a production. And you need to control the disease till they get the infusion again. That's the biggest hitch, because I'm going to compare that with bispecific antibody therapy, where it can be at your community hospital. We can decide that's what you need. And next week, you're going to start getting it. But you need to be admitted for it. So that's the difference. Question, yeah? So the question is, is CART-T, does it work better for other blood cancers? Probably better wasn't the right word. I, I guess so there's two other diseases, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and aggressive B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, where there's been a lot <coughs> excuse me, of work done using the CART technology. ALL was the very first one with the New England report coming out many years ago of curative therapy and multiply relapsed acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I have a patient in my clinic who was on that New England report. He is well 10 years after his CART procedure, eight years after, it's exciting. So it just relates more to the biology of the disease. For aggressive B-cell lymphoma, the survival curves look more impressive, the duration of responses look better, and there is real cure that we're seeing there. With the myeloma curves, they tend to, we're not sure how many myeloma patients are cured, versus prolonged remission, which is important. You saw 18 months on average, but that, that's, the, that's what funders are looking at now. So is survival really improved? I think it will be, and that has to be vetted. But the, the cure data is a little better for ALL and aggressive B-cell lymphoma. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit conscious of time, so CART-T, CART, and we're moving CART, there, there's a lot of trials looking at using, you could say, well, Peter, why are we waiting for five lines of therapy to give CART-T? So a lot of work on, can we use CART-T early on for aggressive myeloma, first relapse? So there's a trial, Princess Margaret Hospital, early relapsed high-risk myeloma. They're doing CARTs down there for that. So if I have someone relapsing early who's, you know, CART, you can do CARTs up 75 years old. You can do CART if the organs, everything's working. So um, these trials are around and available for higher risk relapsers earlier in disease. So that's where this procedures we're looking at is using it in people with higher risk disease. Um, I'm going to get, I'm going to skip this because I just want to talk a little bit about bispecifics and then our time's up. <clears throat> so the bispecific antibodies are the other new um, cellular therapy on the block. And we call it off the shelf because you don't have to go through that big production of CART that I see where you send it away. And you, you know, you, it, it can be at your community hospital. We, we give this therapy at our place now. And you'll see the, in, in myeloma, there's several drugs there, teclistamab, elranatinab, telketamab. The first two drugs, teclistamab and elranatinab, are now available. They have compassionate programs and centers are giving them. So this is a, a real drug that's available to our myeloma population. We're excited about that. We're, we're still learning kind of how to give it. And I don't mean learning, but just getting the experience with it. They're, these drugs usually require admission to hospital for the first two or three doses because like CART, where you can have these immune reactions and get quite sick, these drugs can do that too. So you know, you're, it's just a different way to activate the immune system. So, People can develop fevers and shortness of breath and low blood pressure and sometimes neurological issues. So they need to be admitted to hospital, at least right now, and the drugs are titrated up. This is an issue for a number of hospitals because it, you need inpatient beds now to do this. So there's a bit of a hurdle to get people into hospital for it too. But we're doing it. We're all making it happen because it's good therapy for people. And again, this just works by pulling, there's the myeloma cell on the bottom and the white cell on the top, and it just activates the immune system and sort of the same drill. Here are the three bispecifics that are available, and the first two have notice of compliance in Canada. I think the third one does, telketamab, 
and that, that'll be coming to Canada too. But right now, uh, teclistamab and elranatinab are available at different hospitals. Um, this is not something that's in many community hospitals yet. A lot of the community hospitals are getting their policies, procedures to give these drugs because they require a lot of education with nursing and staff because it's a different pattern of side effects. And this is just one trial. So this is teclistamab in multiply relapse, five lines of therapy. And the response rate here was 63%. And if you responded, you la your, the duration of response lasted about 24 months. So very, for someone whose myeloma is getting really tough, all of a sudden to put into remission for two years, that's pretty cool. The issue with these patients is, and, and using these therapies is there's a lot of side effects. They can, you're very susceptible to infection, low, low counts, need for transfusion, antibiotics. So it's not completely free. And so the outpatient, you, you, you start them as an inpatient, and then the ongoing treatment is you come once every week or two for an injection at the cancer center. But you need your blood counts followed, you're at risk for infections, you need the team to be sort of on the ball following this. There's a lot of work looking at giving these drugs for a shorter period of time, because that may lower the risk. So instead of giving it continuously, can you just give it for a finite period? And that one of the schedules with the L-renatinab is finite versus the teclistamab, which is continuous. So these are the things that we're all starting to learn. Um, that was very quick for the bispecifics. I thought it's important though, because it is changing the landscape of the myeloma, where we used to say, I don't have anything more for you, or I'm sending you downtown for a trial, which is easier said than done for many patients, right? Geographic factors, et cetera. This now gives another option for patients. It can be very effective. There is some toxicity, but this is, I think, the biggest change I've seen in myeloma in the last 10 or 15 years that I've seen. So the next year, it's just everyone's, we're gonna to start to learn how to use these better and then you know, minimize the, the toxicity associated with them. Um, that's it, I, I kind of hurried a little bit just because I didn't want to, I wanted to go through that. Do we got a couple minutes for questions, Mira? Is that all right? Yeah. There's, you can, there's data on, so the question is, what about lifestyle modifications and how does that help and affect outcome in myeloma? <clears throat> I'll just step back and say for cancer in general, there's very good data that lifestyle, you know, being active, exercise is very, very helpful. Um, the diet piece, I'm gonna just step back from it. It, a good diet is always good. I, I just have a lot of times where I sit with patients and they may start talking about extreme diets. And I'm always just about moderation. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's a little bit of personal editorial coming out on the diet side. I think health eating's great. You know, if you like a piece of pie once a week or a steak or whatever, you're, whatever people prefer once in a while, I think anything is okay in moderation. But lifestyle, health, exercise, activity, absolutely. Is there data around myeloma in that? I can't show you, but I can tell you what I refer to. One of the biggest predictors of outcome in cancer and myeloma is basic health at the beginning and how fit you are. So fitness per se is critical with any malignancy. So the question is, how do you carry through? Um, how do you carry through your fitness regimen and other things during your treatment? And my answer is, do the best you can, but be careful. So I, I have a lot of people who, you know, two weeks after transplant, they're in my clinic and they've just gotten out of the transplant. And like, you know, I can't do my 10 kilometers. I go, that's okay. <laughs> Take a break. No, but no, and I, I don't mean again to sound facetious, but I, I think it's also cutting yourself some slack and understanding what, what's, but I can tell you people who get transplants within two to three months can be back to 80 or 90%. And it's just about the key is, you know, to start doing a little bit every day and just um, take a step at a time, but you can get back to that, but you need permission to, you know, no, you're not what you were before. I mean, you look like a really fit guy, 
I mean, if you had to, you know, you know, getting a transplant from myeloma, you'd need to sort of take a break, recover from that, but then work up to where you are before. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think uh, one of the things that the CAR T uh, depends on is on the T cell, T cell fitness. T cell fitness. We actually use that term yeah. for T cells. Yeah, yeah. Great question. The question is regarding T cell, the health of your T cells and when to collect them for CART. So the more chemotherapy that beats them up, the less fit we think T cells are. And so this is, I, I kind of jumped through, <coughs> excuse me, I jumped through the slide quickly, but how are we going to be improving CART? And one of the things will be earlier collection of T cells for potential CART. Um, but you're right, like if you've had six lines of therapy, the T cells are beat up and when you do a CARP procedure and you infuse the T cells into patients, then we can measure the T cell, how many, over time you can measure how those T cells, how long they live and how fast they fall off in the blood. And you want them to live longer and not fall off too quickly so they can keep eating up or blowing up myeloma cells. And there's work going on that. but. You're right, the more treatment you get, and, and it's, it's also drug specific. There are certain drugs that are worse, like bendamustine's terrible, for, but we don't use much bendamustine in myeloma, that's good. Bortezomib, carfilzomib, okay. Imids don't affect T, T cells a whole lot. You would wanna be off it a while before the collection. And so when I'm sending someone for a CAR T, we're very careful about what they get for the four to six weeks before they do the T cell collection. And we're, we're, you know, we have to stick to a regimen there too. Maybe one more question. Yeah. Uh, if you have a CAR T and you have another CAR T, if you have a CAR T twice, can you, what's the sequence that you have? Uh, the feeling, if you qualify for both, is I, I, there is a preference to do CAR T first. It's sort of the so called one and done. You do it and, uh, and then it, and hopefully it persists without having to come back to clinic and get treatment every week or two. Um, you know, in, in the US, when we go to meetings now, there's all these reports about bispecifics after CART or CART after bispecifics. And it's, that does sound a little bit like la la land when you're in the Canadian environment, because we do are getting these drugs now. So I think in the Canadian environment now, what we're gonna see is bispecific use more than the CART because it's logistically easier, it's off the shelf, it's gonna be available in more centers. And so I think the Canadian environment, you're just gonna see bispecific. Like right now, I've got two or three patients I'm putting on bispecifics, because they're, they don't, the CART's not available even right now. So they're getting the bispecific. Will they get a CART two years from now? Maybe. But there, there's a lot of work looking at the sequencing of that, Patrick. It's a very good question. So Dr. Anklin, thank you so much, first, for the time you take to get these slides organized taken some me time before the beer and uh, for what you do every day to help my loma patients like myself and the caregivers uh, we're truly blessed to have doctors like you on our behalf so thank you very much thank you <clears throat> and, uh, with our gratitude i'd like to thank give you, you a piece of canadian pottery and uh, please, again, thank you so much for what you do. Dr. Anglin, I've been dying to hear you, and I took so many notes. I learned so much today, and I know my buddy here, John, was taking tons of notes as well. Um, you know, I think we all learned something from you today, and you're such an engaging speaker and such an engaging doctor. I mean, your patients must absolutely love you. You know, and, and so, thank you. And when you prioritize us over friends and beer on the oh. deck, oh. I mean, I told kudos. them four o'clock, no problem. Kudos. <laughs> I told them four o'clock. Thank you so, so, thank so, you. so much. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.